Welcome to the Fierce as Fuck podcast. I'm your host, Amanda King, and I'm here to teach anybody who wants to fucking listen how to have the audacity to say fuck it to societal standards and live their most authentic life. This podcast is dedicated to bringing sexual conversations from behind closed doors onto the main fucking stage. Because sex, masturbation, squirting, guess what? It's all fucking normal. And by bringing these conversations to the forefront, we help people feel less alone in this world. We help them feel safe. We help them gain their power back, step into their confidence, and have the ability to express themselves authentically as fuck in this world. Because it takes fucking audacity to be your truest self. And we, we have boatloads of audacity up in this bitch. So let me ask you this. Are you ready for some epic shit? Hello, everybody. I am so excited for this podcast episode today. I am here with my good friend, Jess, and we are going to discuss communication in relationships when it comes to helping your partner understand what you want sexually, especially if your partner is a little nervous, right, about what is what you're asking or if they don't have experience with it because the number one messages I guess I receive are how do I communicate this? How do I communicate this? And how do I communicate this? And I can help as much as possible, but I wanted to bring on an expert in this field where it is communication between couples, specifically for couples who are experimenting in the bedroom, outside of the bedroom. So I am just going to throw it over to Jess. Jess, please introduce yourself. Tell everyone a little about yourself. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. First of all, my name is Jessica Acock. I am a licensed therapist and coach, and my focus is on all things taboo. And it has really leaned heavily more recently into kinks and sexuality and non-traditional relationships, which kind of get a bad rap, I guess, sometimes or they're just misunderstood. Absolutely. And I think that that comes with like society. I watch this. I don't know if you guys are our TikTok fanatics. I'm a TikTok fanatic. Um, I think her name is Esme Louise and she talks about kinky history. And one of my favorite things about her is the whole reason she brings up all of this kink is to normalize it, right? Because yeah. she feels that it has been completely like whitewashed basically out of um, history to see, to play into this like virgin-esque type of model, yeah. a purity model. There we go. And so she brings in all of these kinky facts about history, about like Catherine the Great and all of these like huge historians. They used to be kinky as fuck. And I absolutely love it because it normalizes kinks. And I think the biggest thing, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jess, is like with communicating to your partner, hey, I want a kink. First off, the second they hear the word kink and fetish, a lot of people will cringe. Yes. And second off, I think people become almost naturally defensive of yes. it because of the fact that it's it's so ingrained that it's something that is taboo when in fact so many people have it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that there's actually two things that happen when somebody uh, approaches their partner and says, "Hey, I want to try something." Um one is it takes them by surprise. Uh, and they may not know what it is. And so that tends to kind of get them a little defensive. But the other thing is, is they have no, they're, they're taken by surprise and immediately go on the defensive because we make everything about ourselves. And so no matter what our partner is coming to us with, we automatically think, oh, there's something wrong with me. That's why they want to do X, Y, Z. And it's not, it's not that way at all. Oh my God. Do you know how, like, this could go into a whole other fucking podcast. Episode about how <laughs> I absolutely agree with you because we end up making everything about us. So a question I receive from a lot of women is like, why does my partner watch porn? Yep. Why yep. can't he be satisfied with me? What is it about me that he's missing? Is he not satisfied with his sex? Like when I confronted is the word they always use, right? Yeah. Oh, babe. <laughs> just, whole face just got angry right there. But like <laughs> when I confronted him about it, he said, it's not about me, but it's upsetting me. And yeah. I think that in so many times, and honestly, when it comes to kink and fetishes and sexual exploration and uh, non-monogamous relationships and all of this, we end up looking so much at the lack 
of yeah. everything rather than kind of flipping it and seeing, hey, no, this is showing that there's like an abundance of things that we can experiment with, that we can add into our relationship, but we instantly get into this defensive, what is missing from me that mm -hmm. is making this person run away or making yeah. this person feel the need to explore other things. Yeah. And honestly, you know, there's a part of me, I see, I see things from so many different angles. And so uh, if I sound like I contradict myself, it's probably true because <laughs> I see every, all of the angles. Um, but even, so even if it's true, let's take, let's, let's go with the, there's something wrong with me, or there's something that they're not getting. Why would you not want to explore what it is that they want and, and find out what it is that you can do or what it is that they're looking for that maybe it's not as weird and different and maybe it is something that you can do. You've just never thought of it before. Mm, I absolutely love that because it's like, I don't think lack is necessarily a bad thing either, right? I believe right. that lack shows us where we have the ability to evolve. And I think that in general, sex can, any sexual act or sexual thing can be very uncomfortable. And I think there's two different types of uncomfortable too, if we're going to have this discussion, right? Uncomfortable as in the, oh, absolutely fucking not. That scares the shit out of me. I do not feel safe in that. I don't want to try that. If you were feeling that uncomfortable, then you hold your fucking ground. You hold your absolutely. boundaries. You don't let anybody allow or force you, I guess, into doing something. But I also think that there's a level of uncomfortable that causes us to have the ability to expand our own minds sexually. And I think that a lot of people think that that level of uncomfortable of like, oh, I don't really know about this, but I'm also like kind of a little curious and like, oh, this could be something kind of cool. I think that we look at that uncomfortable when it comes to sex and we think oh, I'm not supposed to to be feeling that. But I think that that offers, like you said, a lot of opportunity for couples to grow and evolve. Because like, even if we're thinking long-term relationships, do you want to be having missionary vanilla sex for 30 plus years of your fucking life? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's totally cool if you do, that's, that's your choice. But I think that there is so many more options out there and the way that the world is right now when we're we have access to so many different things and so many different you know thought processes and and ideas and pornography has expanded in so many different ways that we're confronted with a lot of different options and i think a lot of people are kind of going ooh oh why why does that why does that kind of sound interesting you know like i'm i I love a smutty novel. I love a good smutty novel. And I like the dark stuff. And I am like, this should not turn me on. But I just love it. Like, if there's something about it. I think that that's where it's like that curiosity. I call it like the crotch tingle, right? You're like, wait yeah. a second. I didn't know that that was something I was into. And I do love like... So we call, when I refer to smut books, I refer to, it can be literally any type of book that typically focuses on spicy scenes, right? Like yeah. I love mm -hmm. smut with a plot is what I call it. So I'm yep. really into like adult fantasy, which is like fairy porn, right? And I think a lot of that opportunity, like how men have porn, women have books, right? Yeah. And women have audio, like on books and audio porn. So it allows you to expand your mind. And I think that because of societal conditioning, when it comes to kinks and fetishes, we're made to believe we shouldn't be feeling turned on, but like you should, like, if that's your body's way of saying, Hey, this has the potential to make me feel really good with it and we should allow ourselves to explore and evolve through that channel whatever it may be as long as it's not causing harm to mm -hmm. anybody else why can't we allow ourselves to expand ourselves and step out of our comfort zones and try it and like Jess mm -hmm. said something really beautiful right before we jumped on and I want to get into this because I think it's such a fucking huge thing so mm -hmm. a lot of people will message me and they will say, Amanda, how do I convince my partner to try A, B, and C? And just please tell me all of the things that, that, that just, that just resonate with you when you hear the word convince my partner. 
Oh man. Okay. So I get this question a lot too. Uh, first of all, I know what you're trying to say, but please don't ever try to convince your partner. It, honestly, when I read that, it gives me a huge red flag because when you try to convince your partner to do something that they don't want to do, that is manipulation and that is not okay. And so what we want to be doing is communicating to our partner, Hey, this interests me. What do you think? And relationships are about a negotiation, especially kinky relationships are all about negotiation. And so it is trying to find the middle ground for each person. And sometimes that takes some time, you know, like if you come to your partner and you're, you have this off the wall, like wild fantasy that is so far from what you normally do it's going to take them a little bit of time to kind of get comfortable with the idea of that is something that you want to do. Initially, they may be, oh, hell no, absolutely not. And so I think that's where we we ha start to have really good conversations about how do we, how do we continually talk to our partner about our fantasies versus convince my partner to do something. Does Ooh. that make sense? Yeah, no, that's beautiful too. And I think that a lot of times it is a scary, you have to think of where people are coming from both perspectives, right? Like you said, you're yeah. always seeing thing in different perspectives. So that person who is opening up about that kink is already fucking terrified, right? Yes. They are probably like already self-deprecating, right? They're probably like, this is weird. I shouldn't be feeling this. I shouldn't be liking this. And then they're coming to you, the person that's supposed to like unconditionally support them, right? As a partner, whether you're monogamous or not monogamous, right? Like support is the whole reason to have another person. So they're in a state of vulnerability saying something to you like, hey, I want you to start praising the shit out of me when we're having sex. Call me a good girl or even degradation. Like call me a slut, call me a whore, smack my ass, right? Like I think that that's such a vulnerable place to come from to Definitely. express that to your partner to begin with, to be the person on the receiving end and to immediately go walls up right? Yeah. I feel unsafe. This feels weird. Imagine what it would be like from the other person's perspective, right? They in that moment are trying to be so unbelievably vulnerable to you rather than being defensive and, or throwing those walls up just as saying, Hey, this may not resonate, I think is a good word to use, like maybe mm -hmm. verbiage. This doesn't really resonate with me right now. It's not a hard limit, right? It's not a no, but I'm going to need some time to think about this. And I think I always say, Justin, maybe this is it, asking the question, why, mm -hmm. right? Why do you want to explore this fetish with me? Why do you want to explore this kink? And for the person who is asking to explore this, I think having a really good reason of why will help bridge the gap in communication rather than going up and saying, Jess, I want you to fist me. Yeah. Right. I think, and yes, so there's, so there's a couple of things here that I, I would like to give as tips to kind of help in this, in this situation, because I think it's all about how you approach the subject, right? It's not necessarily about what you're saying. It's about how are you coming to the table to have this discussion? And I think 99.9% .9 of these discussions happen because we just feel like we have to say it right the second, like we can no longer keep it in. And that's not fair to our partner because our partner is again, surprised. And they're all, they're like, they don't have the, you've thought about it for two weeks about what you want to say and you're bringing it to them. And this is out of left field for them. And so one of the biggest tips that I give to, to anyone, and this is for communication, just in general about any difficult subject is set a time to talk about it. And what that looks like is, Hey, <clears throat> I have, I really want to talk to you about our sex life. I think that I have some ideas about how maybe we can make it a little bit better, um, how we can make it maybe more exciting. I would love to have a discussion with you about this. Can we set aside some time on Saturday afternoon to talk about it? That way they also have time to bring to the table what they want to talk about in that on that subject. So I think that there's um, there's a lot that happens in that moment. And I think there's a lot that we can kind of do to mitigate that initial raising of the wall way before we actually ever sit down and have the conversation. Um, 
and yes, absolutely knowing. So a lot, I feel like I just stumble over my words. So I apologize. <laughs> <You're good. laughs> I have so many things to say. I am literally the person whose brain moves faster than her lips. So I fuck up all the time. We embrace fucking up on this podcast. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Um, there's, there's a lot of times we don't, we don't understand why we find something sexy as well. Mm. And so I think that that is, having a good answer to the why question is great, but there's a lot of times where you just don't have the answer to the why question yet. I love that. I love that. And I'm too, when we're talking about relationships, yes, we're talking about like committed relationships, but I also think we should like talk about like, this is stuff you could explore with your friends groups. Right. And like, oh, yeah. and like, these are conversations that you should feel like you have a good support system around to kind of let them know. I'm not saying like screaming to everyone, you know, that you have a specific king, but even I was having a conversation with one of my good friends about something that was considered quote unquote taboo. And she was like, I just don't want to know this exists. And she's like, I just like, I can't, uh, I just like, no, I didn't even know that this was a thing. And mm -hmm. I don't want to know that this exists. And I think we were talking about polygamy and polyamory and all of this stuff. And she is very love her to death, very vanilla husband and wife for the rest of their lives. Like she's open to some stuff, but polygamy and polyamory and all open, that shit blew her brains yeah. out of her goddamn skull. And in that moment, I was like, and I was just discussing it in general, but I am someone who believes if you want an open relationship, as long as it's consenting and as long as everyone's on the same page and everyone's being respected, safe and boundaries are in place, I'm fucking open to it. You go live your best life. So even on that end of bringing it up to her of like, Hey, I'm thinking of possibly exploring this. I've been doing research on it and her just being so done. I mm -hmm. was like, Whoa. I can't even talk to her, my best friend about this now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's really interesting because I, I'll be curious and you'll have to keep me updated on how that, how that continues because typically what happens, and this is why it's so important to not go into the conversation of, I want to try to convince my partner to do something because they have, because they have to warm up to something that maybe they didn't even know was a thing. And so It'll be interesting to see as you've now planted the seed, as this is something that is an option, how she starts to maybe process that later on, I would be willing to bet at some point in time she comes back and it's just like, okay, so tell me a little bit more about this because I just don't understand it. And I'm curious now. Yeah. And I think the thing is too, is, is people, and she's a person who's like, I'm never going to judge people, but people innately don't intend to judge. Right. I think right. that with the way people are brought up and the way like they're very, people are in their own boxes sometimes, right? And the topics we're discussing of kinks and fetishes and, and open relationships and non-monogamous relationships are so outside the box to these people yeah. that it is like you are literally smacking them in the face with a piece of meat and being like, you're okay, right? <laughs> like, you're good, right? You just took a 16 ounce ribeye to the face. You're good though. We can talk about it. So I think that, yeah, allowing your partner, your best friend, your person to warm up to the idea is the best way to do it and not coercing them, right? Not right. the worst I always say to people is like, the more pressure you put on it, the least likely it is going to happen, right? Definitely. <laughs> it's like, yes. It's like, when I get a lot of like men who will message me and they're like, my wife won't give oral is the big thing, right? Or she won't let me go down on her is a big thing. Well, that's her fucking body, her choice. So if she's not comfortable with that, you sitting there and being like, can I go down on you? Can I go down on you? Can I go down on you? I got, can I taste you? I want to see what you taste like. I think it's going to feel really good. Let me just try it. Is like a big, like X, no, like fuck off. That's going to make me not want it. 20 yeah. times more. And you never want your partner to go into something feeling forced because they're not going to enjoy it no matter what. They're going to hate yeah. every second of it. They're going to hate you and resent you for mm -hmm. pushing them to do that. And it's going to cause so much trouble in your relationship yes. than it's going to do helping to you to have you to be able to explore that kink. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. And I think that that is such a huge thing that people do not understand. And again, I think it's with how they approach the conversation with their partner in the very beginning. And it's, it's very difficult. I have a, a very dear friend of mine who is, um, 
who is much more on the kink side than her partner is. And her partner is just, do, doesn't know what they don't know. They they just don't know what they don't know. And so I've had that conversation with them of how do, how do you approach your partner in, Hey, like I want to do something like this, or I find this sexy. And I think keeping in mind, this is another good thing to kind of just like a tool in your toolbox is your fetish and your kink can, can be fantasized and still be effective to you. Mm. So you don't actually necessarily have to play it out in order for it to be something that is satisfying for you. It may not be as satisfying as doing it, but I think there is, and this is why pornography, I think, gets, is so readily used is because there's a lot of people who want to explore things and have fantasies about things but they don't know how to express them to their partner and, or their partner has already established a boundary in that area of that's not something that I want to do, which is well, well within their right. Um, so I think like that's something to kind of keep into consideration is when you approach your partner and you say, Hey, I really want to, I'm so curious about this. Like, this sounds like a lot of fun to me. And your partner is like, that does not sound like fun to me. You know, is it something that you can kind of, fantasize about is it something that you guys can role play even just talking about it during sex as opposed to acting it out there's so many different options out there to kind of get get your rocks off essentially that I think people go from I want this I need to have this and they forget that there's this whole middle space in there that of options to explore I think too it's like I am going to throw people through a loop, but like you're yes. <laughs> like, fuck, how do I say this without pissing a lot of people off? But this is, if your partner wants to explore a kink that is an absolute no to you, I also think you should be open to allowing your partner to explore that kink without you per se. I know plenty of couples who are in relationships that they fucking love each other. They are unbelievably a hundred percent soulmates right they and I don't use that term often I think it's bullshit but that's the term they use they love their person they're with but their partner explores a kink that they are completely uncomfortable with and they don't want to do it so they've had these open conversations of if you need to explore that go do that safely keep me in the loop with it the communication aspect of all the couples I've spoken to is huge like yes they want to know they want it and not like, I'm not saying like write a detailed entry and journal diary of your explored kink, but they want to know and they, they don't need a book report. <laughs> yeah. Like here's my book report of how I kinked <laughs> this day, but like it's more, they have such, they have the best communication I've ever seen in couples, right? Yeah. Because they're so open with it and they don't make it about them right oh you need to explore this kink I respect that it's not my thing I love you unconditionally I want to be supportive so that you feel that that need is met because there are some people who want that need met yeah. <laughs> and so I think that if you are completely uncomfortable with it hold your fucking boundaries but also there could be options that don't make you feel like you need to fucking step in and take that role of kink exploration with yeah. that person, whether those options are porn, whether those options are play outside of mm -hmm. the relationship, there are options. So don't ever feel mm -hmm. like you have to be that fulfillment for that person with that kink. Right. And I think that that is such a great point. Um, I think everybody has that autonomy to be able to say, you know, like, this is not for me. Um, and that's okay. I, you know, it's, it is a constant, constant, constant negotiation, um, between you and your partner. And the thing that I absolutely love about relationships is no matter what label you put on your relationship, you and your partner are the only ones who get to determine what is okay and not okay in your relationship. And the 
best part of that is that it can change over time. And so while in the beginning of your relationship, maybe you are completely monogamous and you do explore things with, you know, just with each other, and then you begin to evolve and, or somebody comes to understand something else that they may want to explore that their partner doesn't, you know, there are so many options that then open up. You're absolutely right. It's, it's, but that's a conversation that has to be continually had. And I think we get in we, societally, we get into a relationship and then it's like all communication stops. Yep. And we just fall into this terrible kind of monotony yep. that I think that's the biggest killer of relationships is this oh, yeah. just like we become robots in our relationships. Well, it's because like with societal conditioning, it's supposed to just be the the two partners together for life they're not allowed to like even the idea of looking at other yeah. people, or even the stigma that comes with watching porn like I said there are so many women out there who get so offended with men their partners watching porn and then there's yeah. a bunch of men who get offended that their partners use toys mm-hmm. without them with or want to bring it in there like I got messages from women my past partner threw away all my toys and I'm like the fuck he, what or my, I hope you or, threw him away. <laughs> oh my God. I had a woman message me, was it two days ago? And she said, my partner would put my po- my toys in certain positions so that they knew what positions they were in. So if she used them and did not put them back in that position, he would know that she used them and he would get upset. Yeah, that's a red flag for me. And, and I'm just like, the fuck? Like, mm-hmm. this is like, relationships are meant to evolve right you I think the reason some people can stay in these long terms for 10 20 30 years is because of exactly what you're saying they're constantly communicating to each other of like these are my wants these are my needs these are my desires and they change you cannot expect two people to be the same people at the beginning of the relationship as they are 15 years down the road but society tells us we are right. It's supposed to be just us two till death do us part. And even if that existence on this planet is miserable, which so many people are, I'm like, I get messages. I just left a 23 year marriage. It was terrible. I just left this. And like, I'm starting to find my sexuality. And it's just so sad that it takes 20 plus years for some people to realize like, this isn't a good relationship and like, you should be evolving with each other, but you're right. It's like communication is the first thing that goes in a relationship because everyone I think too ends up being afraid to explore oh, yeah. these topics with their partner because they do feel like they're kind of weird or kinky or they're so shut down to mm-hmm. it that they're just like uh uh-uh, I'm not even going to have this conversation and it makes me sad because people's existence on this planet should be happy and they should feel like they could they can express themselves to their partners and not feel like they need to be forced into situations. I had a woman on one of my anal videos the other day say that her husband at the time would force her to do anal sex, even if she would cry and he would push in, even though she said, stop. I'm like, that's literally rape. That, like, yeah, this, yeah. That is literal rape. I don't give a fuck if it is your partner. No means no. If you're crying and they're pushing into you, that is rape. Absolutely. Like, yeah a lot of people are experiencing that type of miscommunication in their relationships. And that is just like so unbelievably sad because there is worlds to explore out there and each person should feel safe. So just, I guess my question is, what are some red flags that partners should recognize if they are being coerced? into something if their partner is quote unquote trying to pressure them or convince them what are a little like some telltale signs and how can they maybe set boundaries or how do they protect themselves from that yeah that is such a great question um and it's going if <laughs> i'm not gonna have a simple one <laughs> a simple That's answer okay. for you <laughs> <laughs> oh this is gonna be a clusterfuck for sure um <clears throat> i think the biggest um the biggest thing, the biggest red flag to me is the continual pressure, which we've kind of talked about, right? The constant, um, the constant, let me do this, or 
this would be so much fun or, you know, anything like that. And I think that is hard to sometimes see in, in relationships. Um, and (laughs) I'm going to, I'm going to segue for just a tiny spot on this, um, to, to kind of touch on the boundaries thing, uh, because I had, I had a video that went viral on Facebook that was about, about boundaries and setting very small boundaries. And I used to, when I worked with teenagers, I taught this to every teenage girl that I met because it was so important to me to say, you know, this is how you find out if somebody is a good person or not. If somebody is going to continually push your boundaries and disrespect you or not. And that is to set a small boundary. And typically what I was asking them to do was, you know, if somebody asked you out on a date or said, Hey, can I call you later? You would say, no, I'm, I'm busy, but I'm free another time, you know, and see how they react. And I think that's something that even as adults, even in long-term relationships, we can start to kind of, I hate to use the word test, but it is a little bit of a test sometimes Mm -hmm. to see where does our partner, how is our partner going to react to us when we set that, when we set a boundary, because the little boundaries do matter. And then, you know, that's how we get into spaces where they, they're not going to listen to you when you say no about a very, a bigger boundary. Right. Um, if you can't express yourself in the smallness, right. Of like, Hey, I don't appreciate this or him. Even if we take it into like the coercion aspect of like, why can't we just try it? is one that I hear a lot. Like, can't you just try it once? Can't you just Mm -hmm. trust me and try it once? Like Mm -hmm. being able to sit there and be like, no, I don't want to try it right now. And this is making me uncomfortable is a way of really, I think testing if they keep pushing it. Cause if they keep pushing it after that, that's just, that's a huge red flag that you were being pushed in and co 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 hurt co- now co- worst, yeah thank you into told you we fuck up all the time on this podcast <laughs> a situation that you don't deserve to be in and no one deserves to be forced into anything right and I think that's the other thing is like you know I think as women uh, particularly and and I'm sure men do as well like you know when somebody is kind of pushing mm-hmm. you in a space where you just don't want to do something and they're going to kind of try to get their way, you know, however that may look. And I think the tactics get different, right? Like the, it looks different in a lot of different ways. Um, But ultimately it's us listening to our own intuition. Hey, like this is uncomfortable for me. I don't really like this. Um, This isn't something that I want to do. And kind of like you said, you know, the, when somebody is constantly pushing you and constantly asking for the same thing, um, it becomes a lot of a, if you become even less willing to be doing any of those things. So even if there was an, a sliver of hope at one point in time, um, that's not, uh, it, it's going to go away very quickly. I actually had an article that I, <clears throat> excuse me, had posted or shared in on my Facebook page at one point in time that talked about uh, a guy who really pushed his spouse for an open relationship. And then she basically had said, okay, well, if you can do this, then I can do this as well. And they agreed to that. Um, She went out and on a date, he did not. And he got pissed at her. And now they're on the verge of divorce. And I was just like, but that was the, that was the thing was he was like constantly harping on it of, I want to do this. I wanted to have an open relationship. I wanted to meet people, blah, 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 blah. And then he got pissed at her because she was able to go out and meet somebody before he was. And I'm like, and then she's upset because she, her marriage is crumbling and she didn't even want to do this in the first place. And I'm like, oh baby, like the that's. We were at a um, comedy show up in Troy in near uh, where I grew up in, in New York. And we were seeing Taylor Tomlinson and she's amazing. And at the end she called on people to uh, like act like she was a couple's counselor, kind of make it funny. And she called on this couple. There was one polyamorous couples in Troy, New York is like the fucking thing of the season, right? They're all younger. Like polyamory is becoming so fucking huge in general yes. and so much more widespread and known. But 
the whole thing that she was upset about was that it was a man and a woman. They're in a polyamorous relationship. She was seeing multiple people, but she would get upset if girls would hit on him. And she would get upset if he would flirt with other women and give her, give them his number. But this motherfucker would drive her to dates and drop her off at all of these other people's house. And that's just like, there's massive miscommunication there when you were sitting here saying that's not polyamory of like I get to explore all of these things with all of these people you have to stay with just me that's not that's not a boundary that was discussed with all of them and they were discussing how her jealousy was completely ruining their relationship because mm -hmm. of that and it's like open communication is key and if people feel like forced he was being he felt like he was being forced into monogamy to a way because yes. she was just like she would get so innately pissed off at him being with other people and that's just like how do you I don't know it's like how do you really survive something where you feel like you're constantly being forced and, and coerced into it just makes you mm -hmm. miserable and then you end up doing something that you don't want to do like that woman her whole she gets into it because her husband can't take it he gets jealous and destroys the marriage then they no longer like she lost her whole fucking marriage off of something that she didn't want want to do yeah she never wanted to do it so it's like communication guys like it's fucking massive and not pressuring the other person and we're not even discussing which could be a whole podcast episode in general about past sexual traumas that come into play too with some people who have gone through really terrible experiences and yeah they feel safe with you but they may never feel safe in that situation yeah. Yeah, for sure. For There's so much. There's yeah. so much that come. And in any relationship, like we all bring our past relationship traumas. We all bring our, like, even if it's not a big T trauma and it's a little T trauma, like we bring all of those things into past everything, everything. Yeah. And so it's really hard to have conversations with people and communicate with individuals when all of that stuff is swirling around and you're not really either aware of it or um, open to really how to process those things sometimes, you know, oh. and I think it's a lot, it is a lot. And I think that too, is like the overall theme I feel like of this podcast episode has been like communicate without pressure and also just be open. I think that there are, be open to at least hearing and understanding a little bit about something that you may not understand at, at all. You may consider yourself vanilla. You might not, but there are so many ways for people to sexually explore themselves nowadays. And Jess, even if you're interested in kinks, you still have that list, right? Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Tell them about the begin. list that you created. Yeah. So I, on my website, I have a free beginners kink checklist. And basically the idea is to kind of make this like a date night type of situation. Um, you know, sit down with your partner, each print off a list, go through it. There's a kind of like a yes, no, maybe type of answer for each, each thing, and then have a discussion about it. Like talk about what it is that you what it is that is a turn on for you, some of the things that you're maybe interested in. This gives it, I've, I found that it gives it an opportunity to bring up the kinks mm -hmm. in a very safe space where it's, we're talking, we're, we're already expected to be talking about these things. So it's not a surprise when somebody says, oh, I like X, Y, and Z, you know, like, oh, I really have been kind of curious about spanking and your partner is like, whoa, me too. Like, I didn't know that that was a thing. Like, let's go do it. Right. <laughs> and I think too, it opens up her list opens up this idea of like, if you don't know what the kink is, then you guys get to go online and explore what yeah. the kink is together. Like if it's like flogging and you're like, what the fuck? Cause I was even watching a video, not a video. I was it um, Netflix special. You and I were watching it. The sex room one. Oh yes. I love that. Right. One. So it's like, how to build the sex room. Yeah. <laughs> and I always thought flogging was like fucking like slamming some, someone with a flog flog. Is that what it's called? I don't flogger. Know. Yeah. Flogger. And so I was like, Oh, absolutely not. You're not hitting me with anything hard. And then in the episode they explored flogging, which they were like, Hey, yeah, it's gentle. It can be gentle. It can be erotic in that way where it's like yeah. more sensual. And I was like, God damn, I think I might be into this a little bit, but I would have never thought that because yeah. of my own preconceived notions mm -hmm. of 50 shades of gray type yep. of flogging where it is pain rather than pleasure. So it, even with her list, 
when you guys are both going over her list, opens the opportunity for you to be like, did you know this existed? And then your person to be like, no, I didn't. Let's Google it. And then you guys can Google it and explore it together. It becomes something kind of fun and like awakening in a way, right? That it allows you both to explore it in the same room, in a safe environment and like have a giggle about it too. Because some, both of you will be like, absolutely fucking not. But then there are (laughs) both of you may be like, oh shit, this isn't what I thought. It was like, there's so many misconceptions, even like I was just reading an article on like BDSM and I was talking to you about it last night. Like how many, the misconceptions that BDSM is all torture and pain and it's always sexually, what is it related? Like it always leads to sex. So when it does, yeah, yeah, you're, you're like, absolutely fucking not. No, it's like, I always thought BDSM was meant to become sexual for both partners all the time. But the more research I do on it, because I get a lot of those questions as well, is mm-hmm. like, it's not, it's actually a very like exploratory where it doesn't ever have to lead to orgasm and it doesn't ever have to lead to sex. So it's like, and there's people who don't even get sexual pleasure from it. It's yes. like pleasure is not sexual in nature. So yeah. yeah, I know plenty of people who have play partners who specifically, um, you know, just as a side note, it's, it's, it is more about the pain in that space for them. You know, like their, their partner may not be somebody who can inflict pain on them, but this other person can, and it's not in a sexual manner. There is a release, but it's not necessarily sexual. They get some kind of endorphin rush from that. Both of the partners do, you know, both of the play partners do, and then they go back to their, their home partner, so to speak. And they're great, you know? I mean, even like I was, like, I was reading all of the different types of like dom and submissive relationships. I thought there was just dom submissive. No, there's yeah, a fuck no. ton. When you start yep. reading about it, like I was just like, I was last night reading and I'm like, this shit is blowing. And I was my mind and I was reading it right before here. And I was like, there is so much about this world that I had preconceived notions of because I loved, I read the 50 of Shades of Grey books, all three fucking of them or four, whatever. And I saw yep. the movies, which were fucking terrible, but I still watched them. But like that definitely, and then I read an article about how that book almost destroyed the BDSM community because of the dynamics that did show weren't realistic. And they did, yeah. it, and then it brought in a whole bunch of people who call themselves doms. Who, oh, don't even get me started on that. That's a whole other podcast. Yeah, she's like, no, really? <laughs> who are only there to try to find broken women and to hurt broken women. And it's- And control, like, yep. Yeah, and control. And it's so it's fucking crazy when you actually sit here and when you get Jess's list, I'll link it in the show notes. Like go through and have, this is a perfect opportunity for you to say to your partner, let's do this together. We can like search what we don't know. We can have discussions and it's intimacy right? Yes, it's a way absolutely. of connecting with your partner on a level you didn't before, because even if one of you are like, oh, I'm really into spanking. And the other is like, oh, I'm not, I don't want to be spanked, but I'd love to spank you. That could be something that could be a new dynamic you could add. Yeah. And that's the beauty of, that is the, the beauty of kinks is that just there's a level of, you know, okay. So I want to differentiate. There's a level of like coercion that can happen, right? Like we've talked about that and manipulation, but there is also the conscious decision and choice of, oh, um, this is something that my partner is interested in. I'm not that interested in it, but I also wouldn't be opposed to participating in it or trying it out. And I think I think I may have kind of put that in. I, I can't remember exactly on the on the checklist, but I think I may have addressed kind of that situation as well um, <clears throat> in there because that is also a, a level, you know, like there's so many levels here, like yeah. so many options. Um, as a side note, there's also some suggestions and communication tips in that um, workbook as well as to kind of how to communicate some of these things with your partner as well. I love that. And I think that it takes a little bit of the taboo-ness out when you can do it with your partner rather than you doing it on your own. Because like you said, a lot of times when you do it on your own and you're like, hey, I'm really into feet or I'm really into fisting or I'm really into like you spitting in my mouth or some shit like that, then your partner is like, whoa, the surprise factor creates the defensiveness, right? But if they're in the room with you and it becomes a fun little game, they may be even more open, you know, to doing it because it's not, 
it doesn't feel like it's happening behind our back. And then yes. they're all of a sudden being blindsided with something. They're in the room exploring it with you so that it feels like it's something you guys are doing together as partners. Yeah, it's definitely intimacy creating and it's just this conversation. It's a connection to have with your partner. And honestly, like that's how I feel about um, toys. I, I mean, any of those things, anything that you want to bring your part, like that you want your partner included in, I think those are those are things to have conversations about together. You know, if you go to a sex toy party, maybe you do don't buy anything that night, but you bring the catalog home and you're like, let's look and see what we can get. You know, like what are the what about these things makes you, you know, gives you the crotch tingles there, you know? <laughs> the crotch tingles. Well, I think that that's what it is, is like I think too, we think of sex, right, as a way of connecting with our partners. But yes, that's the overall like theme here but this also provides an extra level of intimacy to your relationship because when you can sit there and say I think I might be into this let's look up some more information or even let's buy like oh I think I might be into bondage let's look up for some beginner's kit let's buy it together while we're both here while we're both present it makes it feel like you two are evolving together, right? One's not evolving without the other. It allows everyone's defenses to come mm -hmm. down because it's not about lack. It's just about, hey, we're really healthy here. And like, I think too, people think that they explore kinks because of lack. No, you can be in a super fucking healthy relationship, love your partner and still want to explore newfound ways of sexual freedom because that's what kinks and fetishes are, right? They're new ways to explore this sexual side of yourself and kind of, I guess, in a way, rewriting the stigma to make them not as taboo as we all say it, right? Mm -hmm. That it is because there is a world of them out there. There are, and there are so many, so, so many, so, so many things that you never would have expected to be a kink uh, are kinks um, and fetishes. And I think like that's just a, uh, it's such an interesting world to explore. Um, you know, I just, I love the aspect of opportunity for people. I love the aspect of, you know, growth and fun and excitement. And I think that there's so much that can come, that can come out of a conversation about what your sexual preferences are mm. that so many people assume things about the other person. And that is just, that is so damaging to the relationship. Yeah. I think that even in general, like I had a guy once, <clears throat> what did he say? I don't know. He messaged me on Snapchat or something. He's like, I bet you're dumb. I bet you never be a sub or like, you're like a, probably a brat. Right. And I'm like, bro, I'm not even in the world, but don't assume, you know, my role based yeah. on who I am as a person either. Right. Because like you said, everyone makes assumptions of everyone else and what matters I think the most is that you just have a supportive environment for you whether it is your partner whether it is a best friend whether it's your group of girlfriends that you can feel safe saying I think I'm into this without feeling like you're being judged a lot of the time too and even if you are one of those people and like there's this book come as you are have you ever read yes one okay. of my favorites yes love that book um do you know the author's name I can't think of it. Elizabeth is it Elizabeth something do you have it on you she's like it's literally right it's literally right, right in front of her <laughs> Emily Nagoski Emily Nagoski so what she says in this book, and I love it, is don't yuck another person's yum. And Absolutely. I think that that's something she says, like, sex educators so, should always embody. But I think every single person on this planet should embody. You don't yuck someone else's yum. Why? Because it may not be your thing, right? Like, there are things in this world, they are not my thing. I don't want to explore them. But that doesn't mean it doesn't give someone else some sexual freedom. And as long as it's, like I said, once again, not harming anybody, and it's done with a thousand percent consent from both people hate that we have to like, say that that's a whole other episode right there yeah <laughs> seriously then it is it's okay and I think the more we have these conversations especially like with someone like Jess who is a trained therapist who does specialize in like hey let's have these open conversations in the bed in the bedroom in a space that's safe where everyone feels like they're being seen heard and valued and like Let's make this 
more normalized. I think that that's the whole point of this is like kinks and fetishes. They can be normalized. Everyone's a little kinky. Even you vanilla people who are like, I'm so vanilla. Nah, bet you, you got a little kink in you. We all know you do. There's something there. There's something you just may not have found it yet. <laughs> yeah. And we, I was like, we can offer some recommendations of readings. No, but um, also too. Yeah. If you don't know, if you're like, I want to kind of figure out what kink I'm in, get Jess's list, like go through it. Like you don't need a partner to do it. Do it on your no. own so that you can explore kinks. I started finding out by kinks by reading, like I said, adult fantasy. I'm not a big romance person, but there are a lot of romances that are geared towards specific darker kinks, right? Or yes. lighter kinks, like from praise to like knife play to all of it, right? If you've ever read Den of Vipers, it's literally, have, did you read Den of Vipers? Yes. Stop. So <laughs> Funny story. I read this on a recommendation from TikTok, not knowing what it was. I thought it was a vampire book because once again, I'm into supernatural shit. And so I got Den of Vipers. And for anybody who knows me, once I commit to something, I see it all the way through, <laughs> even if it, even if it damages my soul partially. And I read Den of Vipers and that book, I was like, my friend at the time, she was like really into smutty stuff too. And she could not read one chapter. She was like, oh my God, I can't. She was like, I cannot do this. But that was some dark kinky That is some dark. Shit. That is some dark kinky shit. But there's books out there, ladies, for every single kink. So don't be afraid to explore them. Even if you go, ironically, onto Goodreads and you search my name, Amanda King, there's a romance novelist underneath my fucking name. Um, so when I, yeah, so when we were registering my book, Audacious as Fuck for Everything on Goodreads, everyone kept thinking I was her and she's got a shit ton of romance novels. So I thought that was fucking hysterical because if we talk about smut books, all I'm going to go look for her now. I'm like, I'm like, God damn. But yeah, it's like, you can also start reading some books to start exploring some of those kinks so that you can decide if that's what you want to explore rather yeah. than feeling like you have to go onto the internet because sometimes the internet can be a scary place as well. Yes. And if you need any resources or uh, need to know where the non-scary places of the internet are to find information, please let me know. I have a whole list. <laughs> yeah. And guys, uh, I will be sticking all of, bad choice of words, I guess. I, guess I, will, be, <laughs> like, I will be putting all of Jess's um, social media handles, her website, um, her biography, all in the show notes. So please go follow her, show her some love. If you liked this episode, feel free to share it with anybody. Make sure you tag both Jess and I in the episode so that we can share it on our platforms because we both love hearing from you. Go on to Jess's website and get that kink list right away. If you're looking for toy recommendations, go on to my website. I'll link it below. I have a free document that you can download that is my like top toy picks. Um, and so they're both free. It gives you a wealth of knowledge of kinks and toys, and they can be brought in out of the bedroom in public, wherever the fuck you want to. So Jess, do you have any parting words for our podcast listeners today? I feel like I have so many things to say, but I have no, like now you put me on the spot and I have no idea what to say. <laughs> Every time that people say that, I'm like, fuck. <laughs> I have no like parting words of wisdom other than, I mean, have some fun with this. And if you need help, please reach out. Sex is supposed to be fun, guys. Like we forget that sometimes. That's a beautiful parting word because we forget that sex is supposed to be something light and fun and adventurous because of how much heaviness gets thrown on it. So go get the list, go have fun. And then of course, once again, share this episode. We love you guys. Thank you so much, Jess, for coming. This was so good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to the Fierce As Fuck podcast. And some parting words for you today. Remember this, no matter how hard society pushes you down, no matter how many times you fall, as long as you get the fuck back up, they can never stop you. You are unfuckable with. You will win. Don't allow this world to dictate how you show up in it. Don't allow society to make you bend the knee. Instead, make them bend theirs. And don't forget, if you like what you heard, go on to iTunes and Spotify and leave your girl a review. Until next time, my